gathered together from the cosmic reaches of the universe. Here in this great hall of justice are the most powerful forces of good ever assembled. Superhero Satellite, Chris is on Infinite Earths. Cosmic Reviews by Walt, Source Material, Comics, Comics, comics Comics.blog, The Telltale Mind, Between the Pages, DC in the 80s, The Daily Rios, Comics in the Golden Age, Unspoken Issues, Dave's Comic Heroes Blog, When It Was Cool, Pop Culture Retro-Rama, In My Not-So-Humble Opinion, and Black and White and Bronze Comic Blog. Dedicated to truth, justice, and peace for all mankind. This is the Super Blog Team Up. Well, then, hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Source Material Comics Podcast. We are here tonight in conjunction. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? How did you like that intro? That was spectacular. Yeah, you did a fantastic job on that. Um, Thank you. We we are participating in the Superblog team-up again this year, and... You may have listened to last year's show. Uh, I know we did Roses for the Damned. That's right. Okay. And then, uh, of course, the call came out again. Uh, Hero was asking for some participants, and we, of course, answered said call. The subject that brought us all here into this uh, literary and an audio infinity gauntlet, as it were, mm, okay, is the subject chromium. Chromium, that's right. That's right. What's what's chromium, Jesse? Tell the people if they don't understand. What is the thing that drove at least half of us away from comics because of their gimmickry? Mm, I'm trying to think of the easiest way to put this. Like, you walk into a comic shop, all right? They There happens to be a special issue of Spider-Man or a special issue of the Avengers on the shelf. And they want to mark that special occasion with what they called a chromium cover. So this was, man, the best way to explain it would be like a very shiny rendition, almost aluminum foil-esque, not as crinkly, but a very shiny cover. Now, of course, Hero opened it up a little bit, and he said this is the era of excess, so you didn't have to stick with just chromium covers, hence, you know, kind of why we're we're going with Spider-Man number one. But, Mark, you, you mentioned covers, and yes, uh, it wasn't just, it, it tended to not be relegated to just one comic uh, at a special occasion. All of a sudden, every comic decided to celebrate any special occasion they could <laughs> and adopt these covers. Uh, I remember the, oh, what was it, the, um, I want to say X-Men Alpha and X-Men Omega, which tied in with the Age of Apocalypse stuff that happened. Those were some Chromium covers, if I remember correctly. You could say it was the age of gimmicks in the 90s. Uh, You posted, sent me a picture of all the fantastic covers of the book that we're going to be talking about tonight. You say it drove some people away. I know specifically, you've told me a story where you decided to get out of comics at about this time, if not a little bit later. Why don't you tell us about your history? Because by golly, I stayed in the game. (sighs) I was a part of that speculator market, so I can't, I'm not going to brag on that a whole lot, but I was. I wanted to get those covers. I wanted to see, you know, if it was a new collector's item issue at the top, you wanted to get a hold of that because, my golly, it was going to be worth a thousand, two thousand, one million dollars someday. But you, on the other hand, said something, you, you've experienced something different. So tell me, Mark Radlich. I was in high school from 1990 to 1994 which would have put me in junior high uh, the previous two to three years. The elementary school that I first went to went went through sixth grade. So you started junior high in seventh, then you went to eighth, and then high school was ninth grade. That was commonly how it was done. When I moved, sixth grade was in the junior high. So the last couple of years of the 80s into the 89, 90 school year, I was in junior high, and I would say from the time that I moved uh, to the white neighborhood, um, <laughs> from ha- from the latter half of sixth grade through the end of eighth grade, I was a pretty avid comic collector. There were two different comic stores, one in Wontaw, Collector's Comics, 
and then another one in Hicksville, which I can't remember the name of it now, and nobody cares. But <laughs> I, I would ride. I would alternate kind of riding my bike from where I lived in Massapequa to the two people listening to this from Long Island. They're like, yeah, yeah. Everybody else is like, what the f- who fucking cares? All right, let me get there. Um, I would ride my bike to these two different comic stores, or my dad would take me because I was because especially the one in Hicksville. My parents were not like, what? You can't ride your bike 12 miles. What's wrong with you? What are you thinking? Um, so, <clears throat> plus my dad had gotten back into collecting. Uh, my dad, who was a big avid reader of the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man, and he was a big Marvel guy. DC, he always said, was a little too dark for him, though he liked Batman. Go fig. Hmm. Um, but he uh, Superman. Probably the darkest DC <laughs> title. <laughs> yeah, like he liked, he liked Batman for the detective elements to it. And remember when he was reading Batman... It was probably during like the you know the golden age of the comics code when Batman was like going into space and shit. Okay, all right. You know what I mean? He, like it like it wasn't the grim dark era that I grew up in. Sure, sure. Um, though he does like the Dark Knight Returns is one of his favorite ones. <laughs> Your father is uh, he is a a mystery wrapped in an, an enigma. <laughs> he certainly is. He's an enigma wrapped in a pickle. Anyway, the point of all of this is that we collected together throughout junior high. And in 1990, after Todd McFarlane's run on, I guess it was The Amazing Spider-Man or Web of Spider-Man, one of the two. One of the big, okay, one of the big Spider-Man titles of the time. He got his own book because he was the it fucking guy in comics at that time. Jesse knows famously when we do these shows, I don't remember artists or writers or anybody. I have a hard time keeping up with all that stuff. But I can remember Todd McFarlane having such a uh, an influence on the comic book world as well as the fans. Like, mm-hmm. everybody wanted to be Todd McFarlane. Like, all my contemporary comic book reading friends of various ages the goal was to be todd mcfarlane they drew like him they just worshipped him they you know like what do the kids call it these days standing they stand todd mcfarlane so he was gifted his own book where he got to write and draw write and illustrate mm-hmm. the uh, spider-man i don't know if this was the first time they did this but it certainly was you know, the price of comics had been going up. They had been doing a lot of crossovers. At this point, they had done like Acts of Vengeance and the Infinity Gauntlet and all that, you know, all those other things. And but and my dad more so than me, but I was getting there too. It was like it's getting to become an expensive ha- ha- habit yeah. to follow all these comics because you couldn't just follow two or three books. You had to get all of these other crossovers involved in the story, and it was kind of driving my dad nuts, me to a lesser extent, because I just wanted to focus on one singular linear story. And then they did this bullshit, (laughs) which is the point of this whole story. Oh, man. This bullshit where Todd McFarlane drew this one cover of Spider-Man number one, but then there were like, what? Five other alter- variant covers. I know variant covers now are like, you know, everything's got a variant cover to it. The fucking Lando book we did in December had variant covers. Oh, my gosh. Did it ever. <clears throat> but this one might have been around the first time this was a thing. And it became like, like you had to get all six covers. So the Unspoken Issues contribution to this, uh, to Superblog team up actually has me and Chris talking about some of the big gimmicks and when they first started. Variant covers actually started with The Man of Steel uh, to, in 1987. So that's, you know, this that's about only like three years. Reading. Yeah, so that's about three years before this. And that didn't catch on. I don't think it became a huge thing. Uh, and as for... No, this is the fucking... This, this is patient zero. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it didn't catch on... Uh, like wildfire back in 87, I don't believe. Now here, we sort of do. We we start to see, I think there's actually only three variants to this. I'm going to pull it up here and just double check and make sure. I was looking at this earlier. Yeah, you, you, you Google. I'm, I let, will. Let me conclude my story here. Please. So the point of all of this was there were all these variants. There may have only been three, but I like the picture I brought up has six. I, I, I At that point, I think I might have actually followed this story from one to five. But I didn't last much longer after this. I was moving into high school. My interests were changing. Comic books were getting very expensive. My dad didn't want to collect anymore, and it was a thing we were doing together. There was a lot of various things happening all at the same time that led me to saying, you know what? Fuck comic books. (laughs) And I moved on to heavy metal and alternative music and 
No one wants to hear the rest of that story. Okay. But... <laughs> Just follow his podcast. I'm sure you could uh, you could piece yeah. things together. But needless to say, it would be years before I would read comic books again. And it really, it's a lot of it's this podcast that got me into reading what I have read because I would kind of pick up a book here or there, you know, trades or whatever, graphic novels. But for the most part, it's this book that drove me out of monthly collecting. So when I hear you guys now talk about your poll list and shit like that, I'm like, yeah, back in my day, we didn't have poll lists. Maybe oh, the guy oh. put some shit on the side for you. There was none of this, like, organized, uh, you know, thing that you could fill out and be like, I put all of this shit in my bin for me. They were like, eh, if you knew the guy, he'd do you a favor. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I ha- this, this is the book, man, that finally drove, drove me. And it's not that good either. Well, in my we'll, opinion. We'll I'll, talk about we'll, it. We'll definitely talk about that because I don't think Todd McFarlane – had high ambitions in regards to his writing going into this either. There will be a Patreon exclusive for this show. It's going to be me reading the long text in the back of the book that Todd McFarlane wrote, where he kind of explained somewhat uh, what you just talked about, how he was kind of given this book, because he was quitting Amazing Spider-Man. And he does, pl- does the story go into how, after he got the book, what it was like swimming in his money vault? <laughs> <laughs> 15 issues after uh, 15 yeah i think either 14 or 15 issues after this uh he leaves spider-man he leaves marvel and he heads to found the image uh, uh, but, and but he goes on to create the stupidest comic book in the history fucking spawn wow Ugh. wow that's strong uh, we're, we're gonna dedicate an entire week to spawn when the new movie or whatever comes out or series yeah. or whatever it is they're doing and we'll go back and examine the soundtrack We'll go look at the HBO show, the fucking movie. We'll look at it all. And I will tell you that this was the most overblown. Wow. <laughs> fucking. Wow. Grim, dark, unnecessarily grim, dark horseshit I'd ever seen. Unnecessary. Oh, my. Ugh. Well, uh, just Todd McFarlane quick. sucks. Uh, OK, he's got <laughs> opinions, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> He has opinions. Now, <laughs> me personally, I have been a fan of Todd McFarlane for quite a while. Uh, he's sweating. I, I, <laughs> checking my underarms, and it's, it's getting like, bad. I, I didn't want to get into all this. I just wanted to talk about a comic book. It's getting bad. But no, I've been a fan of Todd McFarlane's. I remember his art on Amazing Spider-Man, and I was just like blown away, just like everybody else was. Uh, when adjective lists Spider-Man, which is just so funny that you have to describe this book with an adjective to call it adjective list. Uh, this is adjective list Spider-Man. When it drops, I'm not... I'm not picking up Spider-Man at the time. I remember this being a big deal. This is 1990, so it might have been really before I fully got back into collecting comics because I remember really jumping back in after Image had started. So clearly this came before Image. Uh, But uh, Spider-Man number one drops in 1990. As a matter of fact, it hits the shelves uh, on June. Yeah, June 19th of 1990. And uh, the uh, title of the story we're talking about tonight is called Torment. There's five parts. Okay, before you read this, I just want to share. I'm on Goodreads, by the way. Okay. Because, like, look, I understand that I'm, that I am, well, not an official member of the Strong Opinion Squad. Uh, I do sometimes <laughs> have, <laughs> have contrary opinions to the accepted point of view on things. So I went to Goodreads, where you know, I always publish from there like what i've finished reading or whatever i the website keeps track of all that stuff for me yeah currently in the middle of reading pastrami on rye for those of you who are like does he ever read books yes yes i do <laughs> um i'd like to read you jim's one star rating if you if i may oh, from jim <laughs> all right jim oh, let's fucking hear it jim. Now, uh, I, I i have a feeling i know where he's going but go ahead okay this guy has this on his gave up on shelf Okay. Oh, okay. I get it. So there, there, there's like a shelf of, and I've never been to Goodreads, so I have no idea how it works. You can but... name your shelves. You can create shelves. <laughs> okay. That's funny. Okay. Gave up on. Yep. All right. So this is from 2018. Are you ready? Uh, let's hear this. Mary Jane, a big breasted 
empty headed party girl wife. Forget the sassy, smart with it chick of the 60s and 70s that won Peter's heart after Gwen died. This is Todd McFarlane's MJ. Tits! The same size as her IQ. Ooh. One spoiler after trudging through three and a half issue, the sound effect, doom. Doom. Doom! Which goes throughout each issue. Does not refer to an appearance by Dr. Doom. No, it does not. <laughs> the art is Frank Miller, bloody with lots of busyness thrown in. I imagine the New York City mayor was pretty angry about all the extra webbing hanging around. <laughs> oh, God, I remember that. Oh, so is that it? Are we done? With that particular one, yes. I will oh. pepper you with these as this review goes on. Okay, all right. Well, uh, so I'm at comicbookrealm.com, and, a, and I'm just going to run down through. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven number ones, not counting a Walmart. What the Walmart look like? Uh, well, okay. There's a Walmart Peter, edition. Peter and Mary Jane are both wearing barrels. No, no, sir. <laughs> it's a parental uh, so, advisory. So the first one has a poly bag. Uh, it says green bagged Spider-Man head. I don't know exactly what that means, but all right, whatever. Then we have one B green bag with UPC. Or, oh, okay. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about down there in the bottom left. There's usually a UPC, which designates it, whether it's direct market or it's on the shelf. So the Spider-Man head is down there in the corner in the first one. Second one has a UPC down there in the bottom left. Then we have uh, a green no bag with Spider-Man head box. So I don't even know if you can count that, but I assume it, there were probably some on the shelves that weren't poly bagged. Then we have uh, the one with the UPC that's no, not bagged. Then we have a silver, silver bag, which is probably the one that you were looking at. Then one that's not bagged, I'm sure. Yep, that's the next one. And then we have the gold. No, wait a second. No, this is 1G. It says platinum. This is the platinum edition, Mark Radlich. Of it. The platinum edition is worth $225, sir. Then we have the Walmart edition, just like we said. It's the gold one. Remember the gold one in the set of pictures that you sent over? Uh, and then we have the second print of the... Um, I think this is the gold second print of the gold one. So, all right. Now, just real quick, let's talk about the era of excess before we get into the story. All right, yes, sir. All right. So the era of excess, you know, you pick 1990s, which is a great era for excess to begin. Even in the letter that Todd writes at the back of the issue, first issue, uh, this makes the fifth, fifth Spider-Man book on the shelves. There is Amazing, I'm talking about in 1990, there's Amazing Spider-Man, Web of Spider-Man, Spectacular Spider-Man. Uh, then we have this book, which is adjective list. And then I was like, well, what is the fifth one he's talking about? And he's including Marvel Tales. I don't know if you remember what Marvel Tales was. It was basically reprints. So previous issues, I believe, and they're reprinted in Marvel Tales. So that's five. All right. We're starting off on a pretty excessive first step, which is five Spider-Man books on the shelves for purchase at this time. Uh, we talked about the cover. Yes, there's definitely evidence to support excess when you look at the cover. Even in the description, the description that uh, Bailey gives us, or Hero gives us there, he says, the topic description of Chromium refers to any of the hundreds of gimmick ideas in comic book history used to sell a book. The majority of us are familiar with the excess of 90s and 2000s, where gimmicks such as Chromium covers, lenticular covers, variants, polybagged, trading cards, photo covers, up to and including anything that makes a comic special outside of the norm that made you buy it. Did this come with a polybag? We're looking at the checkbox, and yes, that is correct. Another piece of evidence to support the excess of this issue. This first issue of this story sold 2.65 million copies. Yeah, and I this, think it's like the most, the, the most successful comic book of, of, of its, uh, at that time. At that time, that's right. Uh, well, this era, okay, so 1990 hits. This book sells 2.65 million copies. The following year, speaking of polybagged with a trading card, uh, Rob Liefeld's X-Force number one in August of 1991 sells 3.9 million. Then, a couple of months later, Jim Lee's X-Men number one sells 7.5 million copies. So for Marvel, grief. For, yeah, for Marvel, this, this was just the start of an excessive moneymaker. Okay, now just real quick, you look at that cover of that first issue, Mark. There's an excess of webs on there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, so, so there you go. There's another thing that kind of helps uh, helps us out with uh, supporting the excess argument for Spider-Man number one. And the last thing I had listed here was Mary Jane's hair. Holy crap. <laughs> and, I mean, look. I, I wasn't exactly. I didn't really pay attention a whole lot to her bus size, so I don't know about Mr. Reviewers. I mean, I, I know that Todd McFarlane could draw a busty woman. Uh, the one thing that always stood out to me about Mary Jane and when McFarlane drew her was just the hair was ridiculous. To me, it, it seemed like it was over the top. So, all right. Are you ready to get into the quick summary I have for this uh, for this story, this five-part yeah, epic? You can- five-part epic. <laughs> You can explain to me what the fuck happened in this book. Ah, uh, here we go. Not not a whole lot, really. <laughs> no. There, there is. I mean, for five issues, not there isn't a whole lot to speak of here. We're not getting into a big, in-depth story. As I said, Todd McFarlane himself says that he knows he's an artist. He was drawing, he was inking, uh, and he had planned to leave the Spider-Man book, a lot of the reason why he decided to leave was because he loved what he was doing. The thing is, is that he wanted to do something on his own for himself. The people that were writing the book prior to this, you know, they would say, okay, hey, you know, this issue where, you know, Spider-Man's going up against an army and McFarlane would be like, fuck, I got to write, I got to start, I got to draw all these people, you know, I got to draw an army now. I got to do my job. (laughs) He wanted to do something on his own. So when he said he was going to leave uh, Amazing Spider-Man, Jim Salakrip, which I think was the editor at the time, came to him and said, hey, look, I've been kicking this idea around of having another Spider-Man book. We love you. (laughs) Here's this. All right. He says at the beginning, I want to know what I'm doing wrong. And I want people out there to tell me if I'm doing anything great that they love. And I want people to tell me if I'm doing anything bad because I want to learn. And I'm, I, he knows at the outset, he's not a good writer. Everything. I'm really glad they gave him his own book. (laughs) Everything seems, everything seems to be going right in Peter Parker's life. He's married to the beautiful Mary Jane. He's feeling good about his abilities as Spider-Man and, and life is going pretty swimmingly. But in the shadows lurks the lizard, a villain Spidey has faced before, except now there has seemed to be a transition to a mindless killing machine. When he finally confronts the lizard, he is poisoned by his claws. Losing his grip on his mind, Spider-Man meets the person that is actually responsible for this ruthless change in the lizard. Craven's former lover, the witch Calypso. Succumbing to the poison and passing out, Calypso has the lizard bring Spider-Man to Craven's former home to potentially be killed. But when Spider-Man awakens, he is able to break free of his bonds and fight the lizard. During the tussle, a fire breaks out, and as Calypso screams, the fire ignites a ruptured gas line and causes a near-fatal explosion. Surviving, a beaten and bloody Spider-Man finds out that there are no bodies found in the building by emergency personnel and is left with questioning why. The only answer he can discern is that as a hero, there is always going to be a target on your back. And Mary Jane dances the night away. (laughs) (laughs) So, okay, really all this is, uh, and and McFarlane talks a little bit about this too, he he had to go through, you're a fifth Spider-Man book. So what you want to do is you want to stand out. You want to be unique. Okay. So you've got a, you can't take a a villain that's already being used in the other four freaking titles that are on the shelf right now. So he goes through, sits down with Jim Salakrip and he says, okay, we're going to focus on the lizard. Now at the outset of the first issue, he was keeping it hush hush as to who Calypso was or what the big driving force behind the lizard turning into whatever he, you know, becoming more aggressive and, and less Kirk Connors than he was. So he kind of he's keeping Calypso under wraps at that time. But anyway, a, a doom, 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 so, Mark Radlich, you were Sorry. not impressed. Uh, you were not impressed. Are you? Is your biggest criticism like 
uh, Purple Flurples here. Hold on a second. Let me read his. What did he say here? What was his name? Purple Purple Flurp. At the end of issue one, he says, absolutely terrible writing. Lizard eating people is awful. Spider-Man's dialogue at the beginning is horribly cringy. And a crook saying, I'm going to slaughter you makes no sense. Why not say I'm going to kill you, which is more natural? Why must he say slaughter? That feels so out of place. <laughs> Thanks, Purple Flurp. So anyway, uh, there's a lot of criticism to the writing. Is that where you're going to go ahead? Do you want to start with your review or do you got another one sitting there from Goodreads? No, I'm going to I'm going to leave the Goodreads ones alone. I can okay. I can speak for myself. Here's the deal. I gave it three stars on Goodreads because I think in general, Todd McFarlane sucks. I think specifically this story is just OK. The I think there's a good idea begging to be let out. Unfortunately, it's strangled in its crib by a writer who went unnecessarily grimdark with a guy who's generally like the wise cracker superhero in a serious situation. Here's the thing. I think Todd McFarlane wrote for the audience that was buying comics at that time. And I know because I read all the Spider-Mans up to that point. I was reading Amazing, Spectacular, and Web of, and I read this. And I remember junior high going to high school. I definitely appreciated the more grim dark elements of comic book writing. I think the problem is I'm looking I'm looking at it now from the from the benefit of hindsight. Uh, I'm looking at it as a 40, almost 44 year old man with two kids who doesn't like unnecessary. Like, I don't mind stuff that's dark. I still love The Wire, as everyone knows. Mark that off on your bingo card. The, p- the point that I'm, I'm, I'm getting at is I feel like if you, you know, if you took 90s Mark along with all of Mark's friends from Massapequa, Long Island, and probably most of the comic buying world who are junior high, high school at that time. Yeah, this is for them. It's for that audience at that time in a world that's going to become what we know it becomes as the as the 90s unfolds. The 90s gives us a lot of angsty music. You know, it gives us, quote unquote, the Seattle sound slash the grunge slash the alternative era. You know, it gives us the rebirth of heavy metal you know, as it erupts from what hair metal had, you know, arena rock had done to it. You know, this is the era of Roadrunner Records and Pantera, Machine Head, Sepultura, everything, comics, uh, movies, TV, everything just goes in this nihilistic, shitty direction. And this is one of those things. I think around the same time we get Arkham Asylum. And that's another one where, you know, it's let's take a superhero out of the normal element that we've seen him in and let's make him go crazy for a period of time. And that's kind of it. There's no what the difference between Arkham Asylum, as scary as that book is, as I recall, and it's been years since I've read it. So maybe I don't I'm, I'm misremembering things. But if I recall, Arkham Asylum did a really, really great job of exploring Batman's psyche. I don't think Todd McFarlane has the chops to explore Peter Parker's. So instead, he's not necessarily having him do some sort of internal struggle dealing with this poison that's both uh, affecting him physically and mentally, he's on a really bad acid trip. That's it. That's all that that happens here is essentially he gets poisoned and he's just struggling with it. You know, I'll say something nice about Todd McFarlane in the story. I think he does a great job of wringing Spider-Man out. I think as a reader, you are empathetic, sympathetic to how much pain he's in. Oh, yeah. And that's an interesting thing to do to a character, to present nearly five comics of him just writhing and screaming and suffering in pain. And he's under the the stress and pressure and constant uh, attack of the lizard, who might as well have been a bear. Like, (laughs) yeah, that's true. I mean, he was just a mindless killing machine. Right. That's my point. Like, it's not so much the lizard as it is just this death monster. Um, And then that's it. And and then it's contrasted with a utterly misrepresented Mary Jane, as the one reviewer pointed out. This isn't the this isn't really Mary Jane as she's been accepted 
throughout you know comics up to this point. This is like, hey, Peter's out knocking out muggers. I'm gonna go get my dance on. This is like idiot Mary Jane. <laughs> I, I I get the usefulness of it because what Todd McFarlane's trying to do in a really ham-fisted, almost Michael Bay, I don't understand how human beings work way, is like contrast Peter's fear and pain and suffering with Mary Jane going out and having a good time and she's being carefree. And contrast in a narrative can be an interesting thing. This is just slapdash. I will agree with you there, uh, just because, I mean, honestly, it, it adds very little to the story other than just, oh, I hope Peter's okay. Oh, my goodness. It's yeah, raining. It's a, oh, no. Like, you're supposed to, like, give... It's supposed to give the reader anxiety. Yeah. Like, you know, Peter's in pain, and you're out there dancing your tushy off, and you're like, like oh, my God, like, someone tell Mary Jane. But the problem is the writing's not good enough to get you where where you're truly... Like, if you watch a movie, right? You, you know, point of view in a movie can change uh, to where... You have the you have the um, the perspective of your lead character, or you can you know, or in like most cases, you're the passive viewer watching things happen, and you experience things like in a horror movie, like you can see the monster, but the but the point of view character doesn't. What I think Todd McFarlane was trying to do here and not really succeeding was get you to kind of you know almost yell at the comic book like Mary Jane Peter's in trouble stop dancing you twat <laughs> well, there's nothing she could do though I mean I, that's the other thing it's like I, well, I that's thought why it's not good <laughs> yeah I, I mean I thought at one point like she was the cab driver was going to drop her off because she couldn't get any further and then she'd turn around and look down the alley and there lay Spider-Man like half beaten and almost dead I thought right. that's what was going to happen but that never happened I mean I don't even think she runs in uh, you know he makes his way home at the end and she's I don't think we see anything from her. I don't even, I, he, he goes home. He's like laying in the bath bathroom or in the bathtub. You know, he's bleeding all over the place after he had this fight with the lizard. And I'm like, Oh, Mary Jane's going to walk in and see him. I don't remember that happening. Like all it need, all that needed to happen in that was for her to walk in and be like, can you take the garbage out as she's, you know, like got her like nose in the newspaper, or, like drinking coffee or something that would have just made the story complete. I mean, do you have any major disagreements with my interpretation of this particular work? As for the writing itself, I mean, you, you talked about earlier going back, you know, bringing yourself back uh, into your 1990s self. Me and you were on completely separate planes of existence at this time because you were on your way out of comic books and I was just getting ready to come back in. And the reason was, was because of uh, it was mainly because of the art of comic books. Rob Liefeld does Young Blood, and I think one of the uh, one of the first issues that I remember picking up, and I think I've said this on this podcast before, was like Young Blood issue four, and I remember that was kind of like my first experience with Image Comics. The grim dark that you're talking about, Image had the opportunity to make it grim dark and as bloody as you could fucking get. You know, somebody right. would be talking and all of a sudden, and there was an audience gone. for it. Like, and I'm not that, wrong on that, right? I mean, th I think that's what I'm asking you. It's like uh, my interpretation was that was the audience at that time. Yes, and I'm I, I am part of that audience. So this book right here, if I was picking this up off the shelf uh, back then, I would have loved it because of the look. Because of the way it looked, that was that was what Todd McFarlane was all about anyway. That was what Jim Lee, to me, was all about. That was what Rob Liefeld was all about. These guys were selling books, I mean, just hand over fist. So you're going to want to do anything you can to kind of keep them there. Give Todd McFarlane a book and let him write. Hey, he's still, he's still drawing comics because that's what's happening. It's so funny how cyclical things are because this is so Disney right now at Lucasfilm. It's like, hey, you guys are doing really good on Game of Thrones. Want to direct a Star Wars movie? Do you have any ideas? No, not really, but you're really successful. So here, fucking Knights of the Old Republic, work on something. <laughs> oh, everyone hated Game of Thrones? Yeah, everyone hated Game of Thrones, how we ended it, because we're not good at this. And mm -hmm. we, we, only, we were really dependent on the books. Oh, okay. All right, you over there. 
<laughs> you, Ryan Johnson, you made Looper. You want to make a Star Wars movie? Yeah, Star Wars is really terrible, though. Can I just do my own thing with it? Yeah, that'll work out just fine. Disney just made Disney made all these decisions with Lucasfilm that were like, you people seem to be drawing money. Here's this IP. Go to fucking town. Mm-hmm. Todd McFarlane, you did you you your your comic books are selling. Here's all the things. Yep. Go to town. Oh, it didn't work out for anyone. Okay. Maybe maybe we shouldn't just hand the reins over to people before we know exactly what it is they're doing and all to make sure there's a decision maker in the room to keep them on the fucking road and not in the ditch. So I, you know, as far as the story goes, I, I think your criticisms are, they fall in line with just about everybody else. Uh, and me personally, going back and reading this story, which I don't think I've ever actually read this. Uh, this is the first time I've actually dove into Torment itself. I think I own like uh, three or four of the issues, but I've never sat down and read the whole thing. You know, it's just, it's very simple. Yeah. I, I, I think that's what, I think that's what Todd McFarlane understood going into this. You're an editor at Marvel. You're looking at your balance sheet. You're looking at your sales for the past year. And the trend is Todd McFarlane's book sell consistently and more than everybody else's book. And so Marvel editorial gets together and says, hey, we want to take advantage of this and strike while the iron's hot. Let's make him the star of his own book. Let, let, let's, let's give him a book. OK, but he's a shit writer. Um, you don't. I, I, here's the thing. I don't think they know that. They don't even know that going into this. Well, that speaks uh, fucking volumes. I'm Marvel. telling you, at, at least from what I read, he has not wrote anything prior to this. It's not well, like he he sat down and had three or four other comics that were on the independent scene and then built up to getting a writing gig at Marvel, like nine thousand other people have in the past. Right. No, no this guy right. was. This is this is a brand new venture for him. Hi, I'm an artist and I and I'm very good at that. And the <laughs> books that I draw sell very well. Fantastic. Can you fix my car? You sell the <laughs> issue, it makes a record in Marvel sales. And somebody comes up to you and says, Man, I don't know about this writing. Uh well, take a look at these numbers. Right. Like, it, everyone just all of a sudden went lizard brain <laughs> and didn't care. <laughs> exactly, dude. They have they're like, okay, that's it's money. It's not really a quality <laughs> story. I can't hear you. I'm just swimming in money. Yes. Um, Exactly. My question initially to you was, had somebody at Marvel not been a greedy pig and Mm. had this good sense to be like, this guy can draw, but he couldn't write his way out of a paper bag. Who at that time, Jesse, the comic historian, do you think would have complimented Todd McFarlane and been able to same structure of the story? The story we're telling is that Spider-Man is poisoned and he goes on this fucking acid trip to where he can't get his shit together. And oh, by the way, the entire time he's being stalked by a lizard who has lost his fucking marbles and is murdering people on the street. Mm. Who writes that story and makes it compelling? As far as 1990s writers go, I wish I could name somebody off the top of my head. I just know that what I would want is I would want somebody that uh, has a firm grasp on probably a street level hero. I'm going to answer my own question because I got the I got the answer right here. Tell me. Get Grant Morrison. Grant Morrison. I I don't know. <clears throat> I really wanna, honestly want to know how I jumped to that. I just uh, looked up who wrote Arkham Asylum. Oh, really? So you yes. would go with somebody that has a good handle on madness. Correct. And OK. All right. Even if you don't keep him for the entire run, because, you know, you know, this isn't the amazing Spider-Man. A hundred issues of Spider-Man just jerk it off in a corner, you know, going, you know, I, nobody wants to read that. A couple of yeah. issues. Sure. But, <laughs> but that's not the entire run. Right. We're going to do something different. That almost it almost seems like that should have been the way the book might have been handled. It's like, you know, Todd McFarlane and his amazing friends. So, like, have Grant Morrison team up with Todd McFarlane for, like, the first five issues and then sort of structure out four to five, four to five issue arcs and bring in different writers until you find, until someone comes along at that time that says, hey, me and Todd work pretty well together. We complement each other nicely. We'll take over the book and we'll move on from these sort of... Um, these uh, bookended stories, these, you know, these four to five issue uh, anthologies that we're telling. Mm -hmm. But I think at the beginning, start off with a start, tell this story with Grant Morrison. And I think you've got a winner on your hands. This goes on for 15 issues. Uh, or I should say Todd McFarlane's run goes on for 15 issues. So that takes us into 1991. At that time, I think he quits. He tells Marvel, I'm done. I'm out of here. This is not for me. 
Eric Larson picks up on this book right after that, another founder of Image. Now, Eric Larson's run, I can't recall how long it goes, but it can't go much longer than 1992. So he may have he may have probably penciled. I don't know if he wrote, but he he uh, he was definitely on the book for about a year, maybe a little bit more. And then he's gone and he goes with Todd and he creates image. So um, I'm on Grant Morrison's Wikipedia. Morrison's work on Zenith brought him to the attention of DC Comics, who asked him to work for them. They accepted his proposal for Animal Man, which I guess was in the 80s sometime, a little-known DC character from DC's past whose most notable recent appearance was a cameo in Crisis on Infinite Earths, uh, and for a 48-page Batman one-shot that would eventually become as Arkham Asylum, a serious house on serious Earth. Animal Man put Morrison in line with the so-called British invasion of American comics, along with such writers as Neil Gaiman, Peter Milligan, Alan Moore. Could you imagine Alan Moore writing Spider-Man? I, I can't even <laughs> fathom. Fuck the Green Goblin. <laughs> um, <laughs> who had launched the invasion with his work on Swamp Thing. After impressing with Animal Man, Morrison was asked to take over Doom Patrol. Should sound familiar. Yep, yep, yep. Starting his surreal take on the superhero genre with issue number 19 in 1989, Morrison's Doom Patrol introduced concepts such as Dadaism and the writings of Jorge Luis Borges into his first several issues. Uh, DC published Arkham Asylum in 1989 as a 128-page graphic novel painted yeah. in horrifying fashion <laughs> by Dave McKean. Comics historian Les Daniels observed in 1995 that Arkham Asylum was an unprecedented success selling 182,160 copies in hardcover and then another 85,047 in paperback. So I'm guessing he was probably unavailable at the time. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I saw where it said it released in 89. So DC's probably got him wrapped up. Yeah, well, you know, that's the way it is. Uh, Todd McFarlane gets his own book. We talk about the first five issues of Spider-Man right here on Source Material. I think it is a fantastic looking book for sure. Uh, I know we've mm. talked a lot about the writing, but I mean, as M McFarlane drawing the lizard is frightening. That is, it, it's scary because a lot of the times you just don't see his features. All you see is his teeth and his eyes in the shadows. Uh, and he's absolutely a killing machine. He is a killer throughout this. Even though some people don't agree with how he was portrayed, I enjoyed the violence. I enjoyed the potential, the the anxiety of, of Peter Parker. He gets his ass handed to him in this book. I mean, he really does. He, everything's going good. He meets up with the lizard, and then it's just three issues of him, three or four issues of him getting his ass kicked. And really, at the end, he escapes, but that's just because the house explodes. <laughs> <laughs> and he was able to break his bonds, and the house explodes. There has to be some lasting effects, I would imagine, from this battle with the lizard that he had. Story of the Five Issues is called Torment, which the, a lot of the, I guess, the narrative coming out of this, a lot of the, the thing is, you know, the question why. Spider-Man has no idea. He has no idea why in the world the lizard is acting the way he is. The readers don't, and the readers aren't given much of an explanation, especially when Calypso is even revealed. It's not like Calypso. It's so funny because he kind of turns that expected cliche on its head. Uh, there's a point where, you know, Calypso has him dead to rights. He's tied up. Spider-Man's just like, all I want to know is why. Uh, you villains love to like, tell the details of the plan, and Calypso just stays silent. And that's pretty frightening. Uh, he has no idea why he's getting attacked, and it's not really explained in this issue at all. I may show up later on down the road, but by the end of issue five, Spider-Man is just lucky to be alive and back at his house. <laughs> I think that's really that's really all it is. So I think if anything can be said about what Todd McFarlane did with this series is it's it it is a way of showing that Peter Parker doesn't win every battle all the time. It doesn't come out of it squeaky clean like all the time. So I enjoyed it for what it was. Uh, Mark, unless you have anything else to say, we'll get into closing things up here. No, I think I've angered enough people tonight. <laughs> uh, well, go check out Twitter and just type in hashtag SBTU. That's S for super, B for blog, T for team, and U for up. Super blog team up. Uh, you can most likely find all of the participants of this project uh, through Twitter and find their articles. Uh, we have blogs, podcasts that are contributing to this and they're all providing something that is related to the topic of chromium. 
if you're listening because of that, I appreciate it. Mark appreciates it. We can't wait to. We hope that you stick around. Uh, you know, we're we're going on 260 uh, episodes here, so yeah, there's probably something in the archive you could find that you may enjoy. And if not, stick around for some future episodes. Really, all we do is very similar to what we did tonight. We take a look at a story arc that happened back in the past uh, or just recently ended. Uh, such as Doomsday Clock. We've gone back as far as the, oh my goodness, the Kree Scroll War sat down. We just finished up a show on Crisis on Infinite Earths. There's probably something out there that you may enjoy listening to. Other than I'm not that, always this obnoxious, but uh, Mark Mark comes in. He's upset about the '90s. That's fine. He he was mad. He he was triggered. He got a little upset about the fact that he got this this weaned him off. This made him. It was give the up '90s fucking hostile by Pantera was my theme, and all I cared about was getting laid. <laughs> <laughs> Comic books uh, are for nerds. Nerds. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, let's get in. Uh, let's get into plugs here, Mark. What is coming up on the Rattlech in Broadcasting Network this week? Do you have that in front of you? It's the 19th through the 25th. It's the 22nd. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> this past week, we did a source material for Power Man and Iron Fist. Hey, if you're like, I don't know about this guy. He's very negative. He talks about getting laid a lot in high school. Um, our Power Man and Iron Fist show, I was super positive. I love that book. It was the 2016 first five issues. Uh, the Boys Are Back in Town was the name of the trade. I'm super positive on that one. So check that out. Um, unless you like me being negative, in which case uh, there's check other... out any Star Wars review that happened <laughs> yeah. recently. Yeah, check out the last month of me talking about anything having to do with Star Wars. Bad Boys for Life uh, just came out. We did a review of that. You can check out our review of the new Mystic Prophecy album, Metal Division. And occasionally, Sean Comer and I take a break from On Trial and we dust off our old podcast, one of the originals here on the Rattle and Broadcasting Network, Long Road to Ruin. It's where we take a look at a franchise. You know, we look at its history, we review the we review the plots of the movies, that sort of thing. Uh, it's kind of like on trial, but it's it's less gimmicky. Uh, we're gonna look at the Bad Boys franchise in honor of the new third one that uh, that just came out, Bad Boys for Life. Uh, you can also so next week uh, we'll be doing the Witcher comic from 2014. Those first couple of issues, we'll be reviewing Worlds Collide and the Royal Rumble from WWE. Uh, Jesse and I will review, we'll t- go a little off the beaten path for the Metal Hammer of Doom. We're going to look at Poppy. I disagree. Oh, my. Oh, my. She disagrees with you. She does. We'll do a TV party for The Witcher. A whole bunch of the Rattle and Broadcasting family is very excited about that one. So we'll uh, we'll check that out from Netflix, the first season. And then myself and Pat Mullen will do our fourth chapter in the long, strange history of heavyweight boxing, focusing on Rocky Amaciano. We've got uh, chapter three was on Joe Lewis. Chapter two was on Jack Dempsey. Chapter one was uh, on Jack Johnson and the first handful of lineal champions. So uh, very well received podcast so far. If you're into boxing, you can check those out. Uh, But if you're like, fuck, just fuck off. Just tell me about comic books. (laughs) Hey, we also did Star Wars Blood Ties, a tale of Boba and Jango Fett. We checked. We reviewed the Mandalorian. We, as Jesse talked about, we did the Crisis on Infinite Earths comic because we also reviewed the CW Crisis on In- Infinite Earths five part series from the, uh, as I said from the CW Doomsday Clock. We reviewed the Watchmen HBO series, and Jesse and I kicked off the year in in interesting fashion. We looked at Fight Club two. Speaking of toxic fandoms, mm-hmm. and then um, myself and Sean Comer did the flip side of that. We did the movie that was based on the novel that nobody understood. So check that out. Um, you know, again, if you're if you're like, don't tell me about boxing, don't tell me about wrestling, just keep it on the comic books. Hey, that's all the comic books we've done that you can check out in the archives. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. And like I said, go check out uh, Twitter for hashtag SBTU or just type in Super Blog Team up. I'm sure you want to find a lot of content out there for your enjoyment. Uh, That is Mark Radlich. I am Jesse Starcher. We'll be talking to you soon. Have a good one. Uh, Bye-bye. Thank you very much for joining us. Do not forget to subscribe to our new home by punching in W2M Network on just about any podcast platform. 
to get all of our content into your audio feed. Also, give a like to the Rattlich in Broadcasting Network and W2Mnet.com Facebook page in order to stay on top of everything that we have to offer. If you'd like to follow the Source Material podcast on social media, just follow at Source Matcast on Twitter, and we are on Facebook at Source Material Comics Podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please feel free to share. We look forward to entertaining you again soon. In honor of tonight's book, I'm going to be approaching the subject from the point of view of my high school self. No. Oh, wow. All that right. is to say, all I care about is getting laid and listening to Pantera. Fuck all Todd right. McFarlane. How about that? Oh, jeez. Fuck, fuck Todd McFarlane and Spawn. How about that? Save all that for the podcast. My goodness. Spectacular. Spectacular, Mark. Spectacular. <laughs> I asked for a list. I was directed to the document. I read from the document. That's fine. Mark Radowitz read the document getting shit mixed up people have always made fun of like robert liefeld like fucking toes and stuff oh forget it todd mcfarlane just drew spider-man like he was coming webbing everywhere (laughs) there has seemed to be a transmission transmission try transition (laughs) transmission (laughs) when spider-man finally confronts the litter litter yes and that's how you get aew wrestling (laughs) <laughs> I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to do stupid gimmicks. I want to be the young bucks. Okie dokie. What you, what's the first thing you're going to do? How about the Dark Order? This is why you need an adult in the room, stupid. <laughs> That's one in the can. One in the hey, can, wanna... two for my man.